The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. There was a scholar of the law who stood up to test Jesus and said, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? He said in reply, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. He replied to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But because he wished to justify himself, he said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, a Levite came to the place, and when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him to an inn, and cared for him. The next day he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction, Take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, The one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. The Gospel of the Lord. It's a powerful parable, right? And it's a, it's a well-known parable as well. I think um, one of the reasons why it's so, so difficult to preach, why it's so difficult to, to get into it is because we already have pretty, I don't know, tried and true ways of, of thinking about what all is, what all is happening here. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a big challenge that, that awaits us making our way through the gospel. So I want to, I want to first kind of let, let anyone off the hook whose attention span is more like mine, which means that we're like coming to the end of it <laughs> as I speak, <laughs> and say this, yeah, if, if the only thing we take away from, from this parable is Jesus' closing line, go and do likewise, and we understand that to be showing the person in need mercy, and I could say showing everyone mercy who's not in need. If that's all we have, show, like I have to show everyone that I encounter mercy, then fine. Then take that and start to think about all the people that you have come in contact with and will come in contact with in the near future and how you will show, conceive of how you will show them mercy. And I'll say, especially with the... With the um, uh, this parable coming in wake of Jesus' command to love our enemies, you might consider the way the, how you will bring mercy to life for the people that you least want to. If that's, all you, if that's all you do, fine, okay? Spend the rest of your time meditating on that, praying, praying for the strength that you need to do that, fine. I want to dig into the Scriptures a bit, so you have to have mercy on me, <laughs> And allowing me, allowing me the space that I need to dig in because it's, power, it's powerful. And there's a lot going on that, that I think we should see that it is instructive for our, for our lives of faith. But it's also a bit more complicated. So what all is, what all is going on here? We have this. Uh, I, want, I want to say it's a, it's a, it's a story in, in just a few parts, right? One is that there's a question that the, law, the scholar of the law, okay, I slip into calling him a lawyer. Some of that is because I want you to bring some of that emotional baggage with you, but <laughs> scholar of the law, I might call him a lawyer, is having a, is having a tete-a-tete with Jesus. Yeah, this is, and it's, we see already, it's not, um, it's not just a simple conversation. Or, Jesus is a teacher, I want to learn from him. Whatever. He's trying to trap him. Yeah, it's a confrontation. It's very, it's, uh, it's, I won't get into it. Uh, Carl can tell us because he's back, freshly back from Israel. 
He can tell you what these conversations look like over there, okay? They're animated, to say the least. It's a confrontation. They agree on some part. Then the, the lawyer asks a question that he thinks will trap Jesus. So it's like, although they agree on the first part, there's an introduction of separation, a, a divergence of understanding. Then there's the parable and Jesus' kind of final exhortation. So I want to look at, look at that and get some sense of what the lawyer is going for. Because if we, if we don't have that, then we won't understand the exchange really at all. And I'll say this, this is, this is my effort to give, some, give like the foundation of the literal sense of the Scripture on which all the other senses of the Scripture are layered. So if we want to, there is a very rich uh, analogical interpretation of this passage, but I'll leave that one to you. You can look in the church fathers. I'll even point you in the right direction. But um, we, want to, we want to get for ourselves what the first audience would have heard, what that confrontation actually was like. So what does he say? What is, he, what is the lawyer trying to get at? He's trying to get at Jesus' understanding of Israel. And it's a, very, it's a very important question because for him, for the lawyer, what, is he, what does he have in his mind? He, he shares some of the chapters in God's unfolding drama that, that we know to be true, like our, our structure of, say, salvation history or even the history of the world should read creation, the fall, Israel, Jesus, and then the time of the church. We know creation, okay, the fall, this disfiguring episode, yeah, the, the turning away from God and the like, the fall. And then Israel coming in as God's, um, yeah, God's plan to do something about the corruption that is taking effect in his good creation to, rest, to raise up his fallen world. That's Israel's role. So the lawyer is living in, living in that reality, okay? Like he knows God's good creation. He knows of the fall. He knows of, of Israel's task to raise up God's fallen world. And that's where he is. That's where Jesus is as well, right? We know what comes in wake of that, right? We know that Jesus is the definitive Israel in the flesh, living out the, uh, the promises of God, living out, I say, um, living, living out what Israel was always meant to be. So if we want to see God's intention for Israel, we should look to Jesus and the way that he so it goes about his business, the way that he's um, bringing, uh, bringing God's promise to life. The lawyer has that frame of reference in mind. He believes, and it may, it may be referring back to the Nazareth Manifesto. You remember when Jesus, we heard, spoke words of grace, all were amazed at what he said. He spoke words of grace, sheer grace for all peoples. And then when he was challenged about it, he said, don't you remember Elijah and how there was a drought in the land and he was sent to the, to the widow at Seraphath, right? He was sent to the pagans. And in and Elisha, yeah, he cured, there were lepers in Israel, but he he cured a pagan leper in that time. And the people lost their minds. They want to drive him out of town. Because the, the suggestion was that it's not about, God's story is not about the exaltation of Israel. It's about, yes, Israel receiving the blessing of God, but bringing it to life for the nations. And God wants to bless the nations through Israel. That's what Jesus is asserting. The people of his day want something more like, we, we're God's chosen people. We should be exalted. We should occupy high place. We're the best. They're the worst. You know what I mean? I put it in kind of more blunt terms. We're really great, and everybody else is really bad. And this, and this is then the same kind of confrontation, the same kind of disagreement at the heart. What happens, though, is that Jesus, throughout the passage, honors Israel's place, right? So what the lawyer wants him to do is say, okay, we, yeah, I understand creation and, and the fall, but this time, this, this new age that you are preaching, 
Does, is, does it include Israel or does it not? Because if Jesus says that it doesn't include Israel, he makes God a liar, at which point you can just dismiss him. He's a false prophet, and no one should follow him. He's a dangerous man. That's what the lawyer wants to hear from him. What do, but what does he get from him? It's, a, it's, it's different. It's a little, it's, I say it's a little different. It's a lot different, and it's a little different. But we can see that in the way that the lawyer asks the question and the way that Jesus goes about answering the question. I mean, whenever you've got a, whenever you've got a parable, what Jesus is doing is he's inviting this person or, or he's making this person step into a new thought world. So he's going to renew the way he thinks about the entire thing. And it's, I mean, it's masterful on Jesus' part to do this. And he, may, and he makes the lawyer commit to something that he would never, he would never choose to do, but, but found himself compelled to do. What is that? So, G, so the lawyer asks, once he gets down, once they get down the basics, right, they agree on what should be the, the life and the, I say, I don't know, what, what should be the basis, the foundation of Israel's life. And that is that they have been called to be God's special people who are dedicated to him in a particular way. They're, they have to love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their being, all their strength, all their mind, and your neighbor is yourself. Now it's reduced here, it's boiled down into the kind of personal propositions, like what, what should I do when God's rule finally comes? So when the corruption in creation is, is finally and fully overturned, how do, I find, how do I have a place in that new reality where God rules over all? Well, how do I get into that space? And of course, the answer is Israel, because that's the mechanism by which God is going to renew his world. And so he gives the answer on a personal level. You shall love the Lord your God. This is how, this is how you become part of the answer to the world's problem. It's to be the Israel people. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your being, all your strength, all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. They are in total agreement. And Jesus says, okay, yes, that's right, go ahead. You know, go, ahead, go and do that. Then the question of disagreement, the question of confrontation, where he thinks he's going to trap Jesus. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? And what we see from the, from the beginning, and we see how Jesus kind of works this revolution, is this. Is this. The lawyer thinks that Israel's, how do I say it? Israel's, no. The lawyer says that I want to say something like Is, Israel has exclusive rights to God. That's the picture. But it's something like yeah, God is God is Israel's God and my neighbor is my fellow Jew. And what Jesus wants to propose is Israel's God is the God of the world. So it is Israel's God, but that God is the God of the entire world. And my neighbor is anyone in need, basically everyone, but it's, it's anyone in need. So again, it's this, not just the blessing that comes to the person, but the blessing that they are meant to be as a result of the revelation of God's generous love. So God's generous love draws close to a people that he has called to himself, and they are then to embody that generous love for, other, for all other people. You can see the tension in the parable. Yeah, because you have in the parable, at least the way I understand, is that the person lying in the street half dead is a Jew. Who might that character be in the story? See, we can go into like, we can, take, we can take some guesses here, right? Maybe that's Jesus' interlocutor. <laughs> you know, maybe, it's, maybe it's Israel, whole and entire. Because Jesus is calling the nation to repentance. He's calling God's people, whole and entire, to repentance. Anyway, he goes, and this is where I think it, it benefits us to, to read the passage and pray through it and, and the rest. I just want to give a bit of 
structure to help, our, help guide our understanding. The priest passed by on the other side. The Levite passed by on the other side. Why? Because they cannot, they cannot afford to contract corruption. Right? In the same way that still, I don't think, I'm not, I'm not allowed on a COVID ward even now. Right? We're so, right, the rules and regulations govern this against the transmission of disease and, and the rest. They can't touch a corpse. You don't touch a corpse. You don't touch a corpse of a human being or an animal or whatever unless you know how it died. And you, right, then you might be able to get close. But here, they don't know. They, have to, they, have, they cannot contract ritual impurity. And God's law, in fact, governs them in doing what they're doing. But they miss the heart of the law for the observation of the particular customs and commands. They don't show mercy on the man lying half dead, even though he's a fellow Jew. Right? He's in that tight circle that the lawyer has, but they don't show him mercy. They don't attend to his needs. They walk by. The Samaritan, I say the guy that everybody hates with absolute venom, dis detests, despises, I think more than we can, we can imagine, that's the guy that comes along and, and tends to him. And the, and the flip, right, the turnaround, the turning everything on its head, is when Jesus asks that question. Right, what does he ask? Which of these three was neighbor to the robber's victim? It's not the question that the lawyer asked. You know, so that's it. Like, there's a shift there. The lawyer asks, because I think he finds himself in a place of privilege, who's my neighbor? Okay, like, I'm going to do all that stuff. I'm going to love God with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, my neighbor as myself. Who's my neighbor? I'm in a place of privilege here. And my neighbor are the people that, right, the Israel, my fellow Jews. I'm good to them. That's fine. And Jesus instead responds, it's not who is my neighbor, but who is neighbor to you? So when you find yourself half dead in the street, who is neighbor to you? The one who walks by on the other side or the one who shows you mercy? The one who shows you mercy. Go and do likewise. It's not a simple command to show mercy. It's a command both personally, individually, and corporately to overcome calcified hatreds, right? To break down barriers of division, at least as they, as, at least as they relate to this, this insular and more purified us, Israel, holding on tightly to national identity and all the different purity laws and the rest, and them, the people that we hate and despise, and they're lower than us, and they haven't received God's God's glory. They haven't received His generous love. They haven't received His summons. So they're on the outside, we're on the inside. It's, it's, an, it's an appeal to reimagine that reality. That's the, that's the parable. And when He makes the lawyer, when Jesus makes the lawyer say what He doesn't want to say, He doesn't even say it. He can't even say it. Right? It's the one who treated Him with mercy. It's not the Samaritan. It would have been a bit easier probably to say that. It was the Samaritan. He doesn't even want to say it. He can't give him credit. He hates him. It's the one who showed him mercy. So he has to go back and reimagine. Now, this is what's happening, is that there are many agendas within Israel to conceive of who Israel is supposed to be. Jesus is the definitive Israel, so he's the one who's going to give the way. And he's not just going to preach it, he's going to live it. He's going to go all the way to the end, right? His, his commitment is all the way to the end. He's going to live it all the way through. That's Jesus' that's Jesus's commitment. And what, is, and what is his? It's this, Israel is for the world. But Jesus is summoning, right? He's already summoned the 12. He's already called the, his new Israel into being. And now those who trust and follow Jesus, those who by virtue of baptism are incorporated into Jesus' body, members of his body, 
the church, right, the church, those who trust and follow Jesus, they have to go Jesus' way. We have to go the new Israel way. We have to go the way of Christ Jesus. And that means that, yes, we, we exist as an us. I'm sure you have plenty of people in your life who don't belong to this us, right? People not practicing the faith. People perhaps who haven't yet heard the call or chosen to, to follow Christ, serve Him, and the rest. There is an us. We, we have received the call. Jesus has called us to be part of His new Israel movement, the way that God's world, is, God's fallen world, is going to be raised up. It's going to be in and through His faithful followers, the new Israel. It's a new Israel movement. Right? There is an us, and there is a them, those who are not, those who are in or not yet. But the relationship is not us over and against them. It's us for them. It's us for them, by the way. And look, we, we have to think of these things also, of course, politically as well. It's not just individually. It's politically. It's corporately. It's all the rest. It's, it's us and our town, us and our communities, and all the rest. It's us for them. We have to be known as the for them people, because that's who we're called to be. We have to, be to, we have to commit ourselves. We commit ourselves to the God of generous love. We're committing ourselves to being a reflection of that generous love. It's not as though we say, okay, well, we're a people of privilege. We've received all this, and how good it is for us. You know, sit, just sit back and put our feet up in the right. Re- no, it's the God of generous love has by grace, nothing we've done to deserve it, He's come to us and claimed us for Himself. And we're then to embody that, that generous love for the other. But we, we have to be committed to that as a first principle. We have to be committed to that from the beginning. You have to say, we are called, we've been called into being as a people for God and for the other. Well, it changes, it changes absolutely everything. And there are, t- there, are, there are places where you th- if you think about this enough, you might think, well, it would be a bit dangerous to, be, to not kind of protect ourselves in a, in a certain position, in a certain predicament, in a certain political situation, and so on. It might be dangerous for us as a people to do that, and it might be dangerous to, to be so vulnerable as to give ourselves entirely to the world in love. And what I'd say is we should err on the side of the Jesus commitment. Because he went all the way to death for that plan, for that agenda, for God's agenda. And we, we ought to have nothing that holds us back or prevents us from following him all the way. All the way. So, my friends, yes, we are, we are a people called by God. We are the elect of God. We are God's chosen people. But we've been chosen to pour ourselves out in praise of Almighty God and to give ourselves away recklessly in His service. That's the call. And today we beg God to give us the strength to follow Him in faith.